Welcome to my YouTube channel. I'm Dr. John McClain, and this will be session 11 on the sovereign, sovereign providentiality of God. And in this session, I will seek to answer and give my opinion on the uh, theological questions that I left you. Does God always exercise all his power? Well, I think that this looks at God uh, in the sense of uh, some kind of measurement. Uh, and uh, you can't measure God's power. Uh, God always exercises his uh, power, his sovereignty. I don't think it comes in uh, units that are measurable. Uh, all power uh, dwells uh, within uh, the attribute of God. Does God restrain his power at times? And uh, I think the answer to that is yes, in the sense that he restrains it by uh, waiting at times on his judgment, on delaying uh, judgment, on bringing a measured judgment or measured punishment or measured actions in order to bring people to repentance uh, and things like that. So in that sense, uh, God does restrain his power. Uh, he could uh, do things like destroy the whole world at uh, uh, a blink of an eye, but he doesn't. And so power of God is always uh, integrated or uh, controlled by all the other attributes, and uh, the power of God is always exercised according to the purpose of his glory. The fact that God is almighty, does that mean that he is the cause of all things? Mentioned this before, the fact that God has power, uh, can stop things, doesn't mean that he's causing things. And this is one of the mysterious things, not mystery as in the New Testament, but mysterious things or difficult things to understand and attention uh, with which I choose to trust by faith that the clear revelation of God is that he does not cause sin and that he does not cause evil. And as James would say, when someone is tempted, uh, don't say that God is tempting you. And the uh, New American Standard, I think, says because uh, God cannot be tempted. And a better translation is God is untemptable. In other words, you can try God, you can test God, you can seek, in a sense, to tempt God, but because of all of his attributes and who God is, he is untemptable. You could say that uh, a certain kind of military tank was indestructible. You could try to destroy it, but it is indestructible. That might be a parallel illustration. So, uh, in what circumstances does God choose not to exercise his power? And I would say that uh, God, in his power, has allowed a accountable uh, freedom and choice, uh, choices amongst humanity, just as he allowed accountable choices uh, with Satan, the devil, Lucifer, and the third of the angels that rebelled against God at the time. Next, why would God choose not to do something? And this is one of the frustrating uh, questions because it impacts us directly, usually in the realm of something evil, negative, or bad happening to us, 
But, you know, uh, a lot of us are very, very selfish sometimes. And we get angry with God because he doesn't do something good that we want. But God chooses not to do something ultimately for his glory. And uh, we glorify God uh, through the difficult times. As Paul said, when I'm weak, then I'm strong. Uh, we see in James, the testing of our faith results in uh, maturity and growth and glory to God. Is God not to blame when he could do something, but didn't or doesn't do something? The sin of omission. Well, this uh, makes human logical sense to me. Uh, you know, again, the one who knows the right thing to do and doesn't do it to him, it is sin. Uh, and of course, that's within the context of James 4 and relations with people and our relationships with God and other things. But that's a human requirement. When God chooses not to do something, it is the best choice for his glory. So uh, we need to uh, uh, keep that in mind. So let me just change that a little bit. There we go. But doesn't do something. Uh, if God is God to blame when he could do something but doesn't do anything. Sin of omission. Humanly? Yeah, that doesn't seem right to me. Uh, divinely, God gets to do what God chooses to do out of the perfection of his attributes for his glory. And I've got to trust and wait to find out how that all works out. We will be exploring this and studying this more uh, in the next sessions. Uh, and again, humanly, I, I don't like the answer. I don't think it's fair, but uh, God's not fair in the sense of God doesn't treat everybody equally. God's not into equity, and God gets to do what God wants to do. When God uses sinful people and nations as his instrument or instruments to punish others, is he not secondarily culpable? Well, uh, this is a, a very good question. And, you know, it, it depends on how you would understand uses uh, when God, if God causes sinful people and sinful nations as his instrument. And uh, maybe we should put that in or instruments to punish others. Is he not secondarily culpable? And of course, uh, we'll see examples of this in the next sessions, but Habakkuk is uh, one of those examples. Habakkuk cries out to God and says, God, <laughs> your people are so evil. How is it that you haven't punished them? God comes along and says, good question. I am going to punish them. I'm going to use the Babylonians. And Habakkuk says, what? How can you use the Babylonians? They're worse than we are. And the answer is God does what he does out of his attributes. It is always perfect. And God uses the sinfulness and, and evil of humanity to also glorify himself. God is glorified in the salvation and election of some and in the condemnation and non-election of others. Next, some governments have good Samaritan laws. Does not God violate good Samaritan laws when he does nothing in evil situations? And of course, we see this in the this principle in the parable of the Good Samaritan in the New Testament. And this is one for which I have no uh, satisfying human answer. Uh, God does 
what God does out of the perfection of his attributes and human principles uh, are not binding upon God as the divine eternal being. So if you have uh, other insights, uh, I've obviously read other uh, excuses or other explanations, but uh, none of them is satisfying to me yet. The only thing that satisfies it now is that I look at the totality of God's attributes, his actions, and particularly in the Isaiah 53 and Hebrews 12, giving of his son. Uh, he who knew no sin became sin for us. We love him because he first loved us. It, I don't comprehend how it pleased the father to crush the son. And I'm talking about, uh, in many ways, a, an emotional uh, satisfaction, an emotional uh, completion in those answers. But I must trust them intellectually and uh, know that God will form uh, a greater sense of awe and wonder of his being.